I'm Leanne, and nice to meet you all. I'm the founder of the Blue Journal and the moderator of this panel discussion, and I'm so excited. We have three very amazing and interesting artists with us today um, in light of Chinese New Year. So House is so amazing to give us this space to have this discussion today. So just to quickly kickstart, uh, can each of you just have a brief introduction of yourself? Um, why don't we start with Catherine? Hello. Hang on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Catherine. I'm an artist and researcher. Uh, my paintings are large scale and abstract in nature and really focus on things like emotion and memory and how they change shape over time. And a lot of my practice is influenced by things like light and movement and gesture and library. I also live a life like Leanne, uh, where I hold a day job as well. So the other part of my practice is in research, uh, specifically around visual creation and tooling in the context of augmented reality. I've been working over at Meta for the last five and a half years. And in terms of my background, I am first generation Taiwanese American. I moved to London from San Francisco back in 2019, and I've been based here ever since. And my artwork is represented by Problem Library over in San Francisco um, and North Coast Asylum uh, over in the UK Cornwall here in the UK. Um, Hi, uh, my name is Yang. Uh, I was born in Shandong Zibo, a small town uh, located northeast China. And um, um, I came to UK eight and a half years ago. Um, yeah, getting to my ninth year. It's kind of exciting. Um, I did my foundation, BA and then MA, and now I'm full time artist working and living in UK. Um, my recent shows, including uh, Simon Lee, and I have work in God's Gallery right now. If you guys have time to go check it out. Hi everyone, um, my name is Lin. Uh, I'm uh, an illustrator, designer, and mural artist. I uh, was born and raised in London. I moved to Hong Kong about what, 2000, 2006. Moved back here about three years ago due to health reasons, and then the pandemic hit. I've been based here since. Um, a lot of my work, corporate wise, is for hospitality, for branding, design, uh, hotels, bars, and restaurants, and they're all over internationally. Um, my personal work is more illustrative, a lot more mural work, and that kind of reflects like yeah everything I grew up on, everything I'm passionate about. And yeah, I'm here today. With you love these people. Amazing. So, just a fun little question to begin. Can you guys use three words to describe your experience as an artist here at the UK? Why don't we start with one? Brook, brook, brook. Seriously, I think um, it's fun because I don't think you know London is one of the rare, like one of the best places to be an artist. Um, I think it's it's super challenging, you know, getting your foot in the door. If you're starting out as an artist, it's it's very hard, just because competition and the talent here is just is huge. And also, uh, I think it's really humbling because I mean, having the opportunity to be in London of all places with all the resources that it has, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's great. Wow, I mean, it's. So great that you guys are based here now. <laughs> so much to do. What about you, Catherine? Ooh, big, scary, and exciting. <laughs> and I think for, for a lot of the reasons that you were saying as well, it's like there's so much going on here, there's so much opportunity, and there's also so much talent, which is a bit intimidating. And you're both inspired, but also completely floored um, and a bit alarmed by all the good things that are going on. But I think, yeah, I'm, I'm always quite grateful to be working in this environment because it is, it is always challenging in a good way. You get a bit bored if you are in an environment where you're not really getting that kind of give or take uh, from the surroundings. And so it's been quite good. What about you, Yan? Um, I'm predicting, and um, 
exciting, and one word you both have mentioned is challenging. Um, I mean, when I came to UK, I literally knew nobody. I just came here by myself, and I had no idea what I was facing. And uh, I think uh, through like years of building relationships and going to shows and like, like just making friends and also like making just like connections um, is so important. But even though like I have no idea where my career is going to, so I know it's going onwards and upwards, but like which direction to be specific I have no idea but that's the exciting thing about being in London because opportunities are everywhere and uh, uh, I think we just have to find the road as we come along. Yeah and just <coughs> adding on to that since all three of you come from very different backgrounds and as you say like you flip in many other places as well. Can you share a bit about your journey from you know being first interested in the arts to doing this professionally in the UK? Why don't we start to continue with Yan? Um, yes, um, I mean, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I was born in a small town in, uh, in China, in Shandong, Zibo. None of my family are doing art-related anything. And, uh, um, I, but I was just pursuing my passion because art is only one thing making me feel calm, making me feel a sense of belonging. Um, so when I couldn't get into my high school, my lo like my local best high school, my mom said, "Oh, I do, I don't think my daughter gonna, my daughter's um, career, like her future gonna end here." So she, uh, my uncle helped me to apply for university, uh, for like A level in Qingdao. So um, I moved out of home when, when I was 15 to this boarding school. Um, and uh, um, from in, when I was in Qingdao, um, I was just walking around to, to universities and by chance I met a professor, a painting professor, and he was uh, doing like impressionism style painting, but he, also teaching in, he's still teaching in textile design. So I learned uh, oil printing and uh, uh, some um, printing skills from him. And he helped me to apply for uh, CSW Foundation. Um, so yeah, so that's why I came to UK with his help. And uh, uh, so I'm just like building things little bit by little bit, brick by brick. I love that, yeah. I mean, we're all building things brick by brick, like right now, every day. <laughs> and what about you, Catherine, from being in America and coming here, balancing like both worlds, being an artist and being a researcher, I really cannot imagine that like, obviously I, it's just so creative, but it feels like very different. Yeah, definitely. Super, super different. Uh, I mean, I have a phrase that I use a lot where it's just maneuvering steadily between two worlds, and I feel like I do that every day in a macro level and also in a micro level. But my journey to art has been super non-linear in that I've always been making as far as I remember, even in small ways. Um, and the biggest decision that I took was deciding to apply to university and I had the choice to either go to art school or not go to art school. And younger me was really scared that if I tried to do something that I loved, I would kind of lose that relationship to it. And so I did not go to art school. And instead, um, I studied a whole bunch of other things um, over in upstate New York at Cornell. Um, that were related to my day job in research. And then, you know, kind of walked a slightly conventional corporate path for a little bit after university, but I was still making. Um, when I first went back to San Francisco, I was painting in this tiny studio apartment in the floor on the kitchen. And it was the only way that, that I could really make sense of what I was doing. And I don't think I called myself an artist or a painter until maybe 2018, um, where I had my first solo show back in San Francisco. 
And that only happened because I met a group of people who believed in my work and told me that I should do more of it. Um, and that was incredibly frightening and very alarming. And I had a ton of imposter syndrome, um, but I did it. And I kept on doing it. And the move to the UK was because of a couple of different things. Um, art in San Francisco is really interesting, but I think there isn't necessarily a critical mass of things that are going on. Um, it is quite uh, tech heavy uh, back there. And I really appreciated the fact that London has a lot of space for a lot of different disciplines, um, all of which I'm interested in. There's a lot of art, there's a lot of literature, there's a lot of film, there's a lot of music, there's just so much going on. Um, and so because I had uh, my day job, I was able to get a visa to move here. And I've been here ever since. And yeah, still practicing, still painting, still doing the research, still occupying the two worlds. Um, not really sure what the future holds, but uh, for now it does make a lot of sense. And what about for you? Because obviously for a lot of you were in, you're more on the corporate side, I think, in, compared to uh, Yang and Catherine. Yeah, actually, it's, I kind of realized I'm a bit more like Catherine, I suppose, in, in terms of like my design work is where my client work is, um, and my personal work is where like my illustration comes through, you know. Um, so, I guess a little bit about me is that I was like born and raised here. My dad's Chinese, my mom's English, so I kind of like the best of the world. They're here today. Worlds. Yeah, yeah, my mom, <laughs> my mom's here, my wife, and family, and we support them. Um, and I always knew that I wanted to draw, like, since I was, like, little, like, cartoons. It was, like, a safe place for me, I suppose. The only kind of place I felt like I could do something good. And um, so I studied that all the way through art college, university. And then I went over to Hong Kong on a holiday, like, um, and my granddad was sick. And he was just like, you know what, you should get a job. And so I was like, all right, I did. And um, that's when I started my design career, because I trained as an illustrator before. And just because in Hong Kong, I was trying to get illustration work, and it was just really difficult in Asia, unless you were like local, local, and even then it's quite limited, I think. Um, and then I trained as a designer and built up my network, and it was eventually like five, six years later that I stepped up and became, did my freelance and my first exhibition, and I found that quite overwhelming. Um, the the art clickiness in Hong Kong is very small, and I was very uncomfortable with that. So I stepped away and went back into like did my design work, and then a little bit, a few years later, again I stepped out three months full time and focused more on my illustration, my mural art, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much my story. So obviously, we have from Hong Kong, the U.S. and China. What is the biggest cultural shock when you first arrived in the UK? Like as an artist and in the workplace, like I'm sure you have so many like interesting stories from all three different locations. Yeah, so why don't we yeah continue with our like Hong um, Kong and the UK? I kind of I wouldn't say cultural shock to me because like I was born here, but I I just think there are more differences. Um I think the three kind of big ones that I've noticed over the more recent years is just like uh, attitudes towards like um, diversity in London compared to I think Hong Kong and a lot of Asia. Um, you know, the just in terms of like just talk about from client client side like the corporate world um, and advertising television, they appeal more. It's just normal to just appeal to be to, to be very inclusive now and appeal to everyone. You know, the LGBTQ community, you know, uh, all people of people of color, uh, and in, in in Asia, I found that it's it's not very common to have that. You know, I remember going back to Hong Kong in 2019, and it just struck me like you're you're in the MTR, you're on the underground, and you look at billboards, and there's still like, you know, half dressed women like bikini selling products. And you're just like, you don't get that over here, you know, that, that's, it's beyond that now. And in Asia, it's still very, like, arch archaic in that sense. Um, 
Yeah, so there's, there's that difference. Another thing client side, I think I noticed as well is that in Asia, uh, in Hong Kong especially, clients love to play it safe. And over here, they really appreciate you for uh, your open mind. They, they appreciate you for what you bring to the table. You know, I found that a lot of my corporate clients uh, in, the, in Hong Kong, they would um, often, they come to you and they'd be like, yeah, we love your work, we love your ideas, you know, give you a project, you look at the brief, and you give them your ideas, you know, and then they're just like, actually, we're going with this, do this for us. And it's just like, you know, you're doing monkey work at the end of the day. It's just, it's just, it's, that was quite common. Um, and over here, my experience with clients is just like, they like to discuss and they like to, they're more open minded in trying new things, you know. It's stick to the mold I found in, in Hong Kong, what's safe and, you know, just what works. Yeah. Do you ladies feel the same way that clients here are more open minded and they're more open to you know, try out new things? Yeah, I think generally speaking, yes. Uh, though slightly related, um, one of the biggest differences I noticed between uh, the States and the UK is the language they use to describe things. So a lot of people in the States um, in a corporate setting are always super, super hyperbolic uh, in a way that's, oh my God, that is amazing. That's the best thing I've ever seen. Like, that's terrific. And then I come over to the UK and like the, the best form of praise is, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> okay, all right, fair enough. Uh, yeah, but I, I think I've experienced a lot of uh, similar things in terms of bravery um, and client work. Um, and yeah, I think unrelated to, to client work, one of the other differences that I noticed here was that suddenly I just didn't know where to buy anything and I had a lot of ridiculous Google searches uh, to the likes of where to buy bubble wrap in the UK <laughs> or what is the hardware store called in the UK and that basically went on for you know a couple of months until I finally got the hang of it so yeah small adjustments I can personally relate a lot I think like during this conversation you guys will feel that I'm very Exciting to say because I'm Americanly educated, so like the big like OMG, like I feel you, yeah, yeah. So I want for again any like big cultural differences that you notice, especially from you know having studied in China before. Yeah, um, I think when I came to UK, opposite to you, you were born here. Um, my language was really bad, <laughs> so. I didn't notice much because I was just like constantly learning things. I think because I was learning, so um, all the new culture shock plus language becoming new knowledge to me. So I just like trying to adapt them instead of trying to find a difference. I'm just oh, okay, they do it like this way. Um, but I do notice like um, because my language was bad, so I was feel like a little bit excluded. Um, by my class, um, I think that's what like UK society still need to work on because when someone's language is bad, don't try to like um, just like ignore them or see them as transparent. I think a lot of my um, Chinese classmates uh, or like Asian classmates uh, or like other from other parts of the world, but because English was not their language, so like they experienced a similar thing to me, uh, which is being excluded. But then once um, when I start like my communication, uh, start talking well, then I realize it's not really hard to be involved into community works. Um, so I feel like um, a lot of um, a lot of my friends um, they were like shy. But being shy is not a solution in the UK. You have to be brave just to speak up. And uh, um, I do notice a lot of um, like cultural diversity in the UK, uh, like LGBTQ, and that's when I realized myself, uh, my identity, uh, my queerness uh, through uh, club, uh, drag club, uh, 
through going to different um, networking, I realized, yeah, I can relate to that. I'm not, I'm not what I thought I was. I'm, I'm someone, uh, someone different. It's a good discovery of itself. Um, yeah, and the, also, I had galleries in in China. That was like, oh, I only want paintings. I only want if you do pink color. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, or, um, this scale, this composition, can you do another theory of this? Um, from uh, like when my, uh, just after I graduated RCA, I got some requests like that, and uh, I took it because I needed I need the money to survive. But um, if you give me that job now, I'd be like, no, you give you you sell what I give you, and uh, that's that's all you get. <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. This is not a commission because making art is not making a living. There, there are two different things. The idea is of portraiture as well. Uh, when you were in China, portraiture. Oh yeah. Um, so um, after I started uh, making self portrait, um, I lost some of the connections in China because they, I don't think they want individuals to be uh, to be represented that way, and uh, I have lost some of my Chinese connections. Um, but I didn't think that was a loss. I feel like that's a gain because I lost something because I realized that's not for me. But someone will come for me for, for who I am instead of for something they want me to be. Wow. Well, I sense the both of you nodding your heads like crazy. <laughs> Is there anything you would like to add about this? Or anything on your own personal experience that you can relate to? Well, I think the exclude like the exclusion in, in, in the Hong Kong was, you know, I think it's something we might discuss a bit later on as well. It's just um, they they tend if you don't fit the mold, then you're kind of like shunned. You know, you're not spoke you're outside out of mind kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's like yeah, the community, like the LGBTQ community and just in Hong Kong, it's just very. It's so. It's so small, and if, if you if you don't click with the right people, then you're just you're just not in that world. It's very hard. And like coming over here, you have the one of the best things about London. It's just it's so open. There's something for everyone here, and you know you won't see the same faces all the time. It's it's really nice. I have a question for you. So um, because I feel excluded because I feel that. That was because of my language. Do you ever feel like that um, um, because of your how you look? I had the in the UK. Yeah, in the UK, growing up in school, I had that quite a lot. Like I, it's weird. I didn't really notice it until I was older. It was just like being excluded and just not being. Yeah, I think not being fully white. You're not part of and going to like a predominantly white school. Um, not all schools are like that, but some of the ones that I went to were, so I did, yeah, growing up more so, and in Hong Kong it was different, like, I think if you're, I think in Hong Kong if you're white, they kind of look up to you a bit more there, I think mean, due to like colonialism and all that stuff, so, yeah. Do you think, like, where you come from play a part in, like, how you get represented with, like, galleries and the like, opportunities here? Yeah, I think so. I mean, because my work isn't necessarily directly connected to being Asian, and it's, it's not like a direct representation, I always get a lot of questions about, like, huh, what role does your culture play in your work? Um, and that always has to be a conversation. And I think it's good, but it's good, but I think it's an extra conversation that uh, wouldn't necessarily happen if I were, for example, a white British male painter. Um, and yeah, I think uh, to answer the question of how the, the culture shows up in the work, um, it's basically my first introduction to art was through brush painting. Um, and those big uh, landscape paintings, Shan uh, Hua, where it's on rice paper, it's on ink, it's about big mountains and the rivers and 
a lot of those same gestures and textures and ways of layering still show up in, in the paintings, but it's not necessarily to the point of like, ah, you know, it's a one-to-one -one kind of relationship between um, me and, and the works. What about you, Dan? Um, because I paint myself, so it's kind of unavoidable just to go to that direction. Um, from the beginning, I was uh, painting like portrait without faces because I didn't want myself to be projected in a painting. I wanted to be more universal. But at least I realized if I want one, uh, if I want to tell one story, if I want to uh, spread one type of information, if I want to. Uh, promote uh, LGBTQ rights, promote Asian rights, I have to use myself as an example. To, so to step up is the only one way for me. That's that's how I feel. Uh, so I started painting myself and tell my own story. And uh, I feel there are a lot of misunderstandings about uh, Oriental culture or like people be like uh, having cliche ideas about it. So I feel like to talk about it is the best way to maybe to correct some of those thoughts. So I have a question for both of you. Um, like it goes back to the question about a uh, culture shock. Like one thing I kind of realized being here and just talking to like you know my brother who lives here and he's a musician. And um, do you like the UK has like some really good funding for like the arts? Like, you know, as opposed to Hong Kong, which is, it's very limited. Over here, you've got like different grants, trusts, and schemes. Uh, do you, have you like applied to this or have you looked into that? Um, I looked, but I haven't tried to apply for anything. I did go one um, from Barbican Arts Center, Artist Trust. So it was a, a small award. I just applied and I got it. It was kind of a shock because I was not in UK and then. And my friend texted me, was like, you won, where are you? And people were like, where do you want to go on stage? I was like, oh, I'm not like in the country, I'm in Spain. <laughs> so I did it try a couple of times and I got one. And I, I mean, it was not a lot of money, but I feel really happy about it. Yeah, for me, it's a bit of a tricky situation because I think a lot of the funding uh, has the prerequisite of having an education in the arts. And I, you know, from from my experience of both uh, studying in the states and not necessarily having that background, I find myself not eligible for for a lot of those uh, funding pools. But I don't know. I think I am still considering maybe there is one day that I'll go and get an MFA somewhere uh, because I do think it's really good just to to have colleagues and peers who are working on the same things. So for me, not now, but perhaps in the future. There are a lot of fundings in UK. They are open for people who's living in UK instead of holding a British passport. That's why I find like it's really open-minded and allowing a lot, a lot more people to apply. All right, I'll be doing this Google searches after this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I love how you know all of you have experiences by just like being here. That it really like it just quite eye-opening. Yeah. And my upcoming question, I think it's um, not so much about being in the UK, but more of being an Asian creative. And I'm not sure if any one of you in the audience might resonate. So for me, at least personally, being in the creative space uh, was not what my parents planned for me, my very typical Asian parent. And um, yeah, so I just want to know more about your personal journeys on managing like Asian family expectations um, to becoming an artist and chasing your passion. Yeah, um, Catherine, do you want to start on that? Yeah, it's the good old stakeholder management, but family version. <laughs> um, but yeah, my, my parents have no experience in the arts. Um, much like you, I was the, the first one in my family that had anything to do with the creative space and I think I'm I'm slightly free of this worry just because I still occupy with work so on one hand my parents have uh, the ability to go like okay like our daughter has a tech job like that's easily explainable um, fair enough um, but on the other hand uh, 
they they do understand. Um, if not the true nature of my artwork, they do understand the fact that I get a lot of joy from that, and I do think that's the part that translates. Um, the the situation might change if I ever uh, go to arts full time, but I do think that's the bridge that I'll cross when I get to. But generally, oh, are you a single child? Uh, I have a younger sister, but she's 10 years younger than I am. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I think that, that kind of plays into it, but also kind of not. I think my sister um, does have it a little bit easier because I was a weird one that had a bunch of interests and, you know, like moved across the world and I'm still here. <laughs> so, yeah. But no, I think my parents are great. Like I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for their generosity and interpretation, and they've always had a lot of trust in me, even though the specifics might not align. Like the general trajectory is like, okay, you do you. Um, we love you, and it's gonna be fine. So, yeah, that's been good. Um, but so they are putting a lot of hope on you. But they are still paying for your life, like your um, your studio. No, that comes from that comes from corporate world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that, that's the funder. Wow. What about you? What about you? Yeah, because I know, like you mentioned um, in our conversation prior, that your parents are quite supportive. Yeah, it's like my parents are really open-minded. Um, and really conservative at the same time. So, like, for example, they would not see me dressing drag, they would not see me uh, wearing a lot of makeup or wearing like, super short skirts. Uh, they would be like, you have to cover yourself. Um, but they are super supportive of me or for me doing what I want to do. Um, yeah, um, they have no idea what I'm doing. They have no idea about my artwork. <laughs> so, um, just when I was little, like when I was growing up, um, because my parents are super busy with their business, so my dad's like, what do you want to do? And uh, so I would just draw. So they think, give me a piece of paper, give me something to draw from, is a way to distract me, to stop me bothering them. <laughs> so since I was growing up, so just give me a piece of paper, and that's how I grow up. And then when I grow a little bit older, my dad's like, okay, a piece of paper isn't enough. Let's find her a studio. So my dad just drove me around the city, and then he literally just drove me around and be like, oh, there's our studio, there's an advert, let's go ask them. <laughs> so that's how he, how he found me my first studio. And then uh, I started like drawing, and then the tutor was like, Oh, I think your daughter um, can learn like something like gouache painting. So my dad took me to a different studio through recommendation. And so when I was growing up, he just he just like basically like sending me to different studios, following different tutors. And then uh, I couldn't get into the my high school, like I mentioned earlier. My dad said, like, "What do you want to do?" I said, "I want to do art." And then he sent me to this A level, which is focusing on business, accounting, um, mathematics, <laughs> physics, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, chemistry. So they had this A level, this Chinese A level only had five courses, and I'm I'm bad at all of them. <laughs> and then, and then uh, I, I met this professor, and my dad said, okay, if you want to do that, that's what you want to do. So I got into my foundation with a um, Chinese and uh, art school. That's how I got into my A level. Nothing to do with other things. And then my dad was like, so you got into art college, is that what you want to do? I said, yes, that's what I want to do. So they paid for my tuition for um, six years. And then after that, but, but, but my parents are not wealthy. They are just saving money for me. 
Yeah, and I'm the only child, and then my dad always got noises around his friend circle saying, you cannot just pay that much money to your daughter because she's a daughter, she's going to marry out, she's going to, like, <laughs> you, you're going to lose all this money, and she's <laughs> not, not going to give you anything, you're going to end up alone and die. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of my dad's friends, is including my dad's brother, I feel really bad to say this because I do respect him, but he's been telling my dad to stop paying for me. And then after I finished my uh, RC um, MA course, um, my my dad called me and was like, do you want to find a job? And I said, I want to do art. My, my dad was like, okay, but just bear in mind, we cannot support you forever, and you have to um, be financially independent somehow. And uh, uh, like, you have to, you, you need to think about like, you better find a job or find another way. And, and uh, but I got super lucky at my degree show. Um, a, a really good Japanese collector for five paintings of mine. Yeah. So and I was like, okay, yes. I got my funding. Yeah. <laughs> so I was just painting in my bedroom and the rapping works for Japan. And then I got, uh, but I had no idea what the next option is gonna be. So I was just, um, just like attend all the private views I can reach reach out to, like or just like be with friends if I can, and then. Uh, other opportunity just popped up. Like from the beginning, I was just waiting for the next one. I'm, I would just do one project and wait for the next one, wait for the next one. I had no right to choose because I just can't afford to. Uh, but I think I just got super lucky with my career. <laughs> it, sound, it sounds, sorry to interrupt, it sounds like your father was incredibly supportive, yeah. but what was your yeah. mother's perspective on it? And was she giving him a hard time to like, we, we can't keep doing this? I think my mom is the same. My mom is slightly more open-minded. Uh, yeah, my mom would be like, because my my dad is really bad at business, so my mom was running the shop mostly by, by myself. And then my dad, when he could, he would just go to the countryside. He would just like he would do farming. He'd rather do farming than doing business. And uh, for once, he had like a dozen chicken and a dozen goose and uh, five peacocks. And then uh, the na our neighbor stole the peacock and then... Uh, <laughs> they stole the peacock. Yeah, and then uh, it's a person working for my dad said, Oh, your peacock died, then my dad never saw a body. <laughs> and uh, so my, my mom, uh, we had a conversation, my mom said because she's running the business for two decades by herself with very little input of my dad. I mean bless my dad, he tried but he he's really bad at it. He's genuinely bad. Like if you see this person, this thing is 100 grand then you, you, you bought it for 50 and then the people said, 60, can you do it? Like, yeah. <laughs> so, he doesn't know how to haggle and my, my mom would rather if he stay away from it. <laughs> and then my mom uh, had a conversation with me. My mom said, um, I really don't like my job. She said, I, I'm doing this for our family because your dad can't make money. I mean, he tried and uh, she said, he he trying to help, but he's always makes things worse. <laughs> and uh, she said, I want you to do something you love, but don't do anything for money. Just do things because you like it. And I said, I want to do art. My mom said, if that's what you love, so just go ahead, do it. Do you feel incredibly lucky that you had that yeah. incredible support? I know so many artists who haven't had that, or there's been a split mm -hmm. support that the father may be supported, but never told the wife that he was sending the daughter money for so many years. <laughs> but he must, they must be incredibly proud of you. I think they are now, they wasn't before. <laughs> they wasn't before, but they still support, they still, they were still supporting me. But, so I just feel extremely lucky to have my parents. Absolutely. And I love them so much. I haven't seen them for three years. And, uh, I just like I just can't wait to see them. So do they have one of your artworks in their home? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why? I mean I show some of them that and then they just like, 
Oh, okay, so don't really understand. And, uh, because you don't, like, you don't yeah, <laughs> that's why I told him it was small. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that's so beautiful. Yeah, I mean, just having all that support and them allowing you to really chase your dreams and being here and being so far away. I'm, I'm sure they must like miss you so much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I really can't wait to see them this summer. Yeah, I'll play soon. Soon, for sure. And for Lauren, like, your parents are right here. Like, is there anything that he wants to say? Or are you allowed to say anything? Be careful. <laughs> 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 My parents can't understand English, so you have to. <laughs> My, my stepmom's always been supportive, actually. Actually, it's like, mm -hmm. again, just like going back, because I'm, I'm half white, so my mom, my, my birth mom, she was. She was always like, you know what, I support you no matter what. Um, but my dad, uh, it's not like he, he didn't actually not support me. He knew, like, I think, like with you, he knew that it would be joy and happiness. But he was always, like, you know, he always pushed me to, to like, perfect, like, into a profession. Like, but you know, the stereotype story of us, like, you know, Asian parents wanting to, to be a lawyer, a doctor, uh, an accountant, you know. But um, I always, I was, A, I was really lucky that I always knew what I wanted to do. And I was, B, I was really bad at everything else. So that really helped, like, he, yeah, he saw my, my grades, he was like, oh, it's a lost cause. Um, but, um, you know, as you get older, I think you realize that, like, I mean, B, my, my, my dad and his family, um, they're like first immigrant, first generation immigrants, you know, and, for them coming to the UK especially, it, it was tough, you know. I remember him telling me stories about how it was growing up in London, you know, the racism that was just like, wasn't considered racism back then, but the tough times that he went through, the, the, the hard work that, you know, you're either a laundrette or, or, a, or you're in a Chinese takeaway and, or restaurant, and that's where we lived above, you know, and he worked his ass off. But all of my family did, and they put us through school. And the reasons why they want you to have a profession isn't because they don't, you know, yeah, joy is like not a thing in, I find a lot in Asian cultures. It's just like, you don't enjoy things, you, you do things. Um, but he just, it was more so the fact, he always used to say to me, it's not that I don't want you to enjoy it, it's more because I just want you to be comfortable. I don't want you to go through the struggles that we went through. You know, we, we, we did this for you guys. So that, and, and as you grow up, you, you really appreciate that, you know. And when you're younger, you just, I just want to draw that you can, you know, you can do this. But you also have to remember as well is that they don't see the world from your point of view growing up. They don't see stuff like how the internet benefits, or when it first came in, how it benefits everything. And, what design work incorporates and what art actually does, you know, they don't see it, they ne they don't, they're not exposed to any of that. And when you're growing up, you don't realize that. It's only when you're older that you can appreciate from their perspective. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I feel that so much. Um, the parents are like, what is a podcast? Like, what is Instagram? Like, yeah, because um, I, I flew all the way from Hong Kong to do this. <laughs> so everyone's just like, yeah, why are you like hosting something in London and like posting it online? Like, are people even like watching things online anymore? Like, oh yeah, like YouTube is still very much alive. <laughs> yeah, so no, thank you so much for sharing all your stories. I mean, it's quite, I think, universal when I spoke to each of you individually prior to this, that we all have some sort of like experiences with like family expectation. So, would you have any advice, actually, uh, for young creatives looking to explore opportunities here in London? Catherine, you're like nodding, so I'm like pointing the scene in the first. Yeah, I, a lot of things. I, I mean, I, I kind of frame it in in the context of what would I have wished to know maybe five years ago, give or take. And I think a lot of it is around bravery. I think um, a lot of things aren't going to work out immediately, but if you keep on doing the thing, and if you believe in the thing, even if you feel incredibly scared, opportunities are going to happen. You just have to keep on doing the thing. The second thing that has been really helpful for me um, is just finding like-minded people, because I think 
it's really, really easy to be isolated, um, at least in my art practice, because creating and painting is a pretty, it's a pretty alone kind of activity, um, and doesn't really afford opportunities to collaborate in the same way that other disciplines, for example, like music, um, might lead to. And so finding those people and and having those conversations about the good stuff, the bad stuff, like the stuff that's really bothering you, and just being open and honest is just a really, really good and stable sort of support system to carry you through uh, to whatever is next. Absolutely. I mean, that's why we're here today, really, to have this conversation and like to meet the like-minded people. What about you, Yai? I think Catherine so well said, you you pretty much cover the whole thing. <laughs> but yeah, it's like you have to believe in yourself and uh, to yeah, just know you're doing the right thing. But meanwhile, you have to be honest um, and be true to people around you and uh, have like minded friends supporting, just supporting each other is so important. Um, yeah, and uh, just and uh, just make sure like when you do your work, don't get distracted. Just bury your head down and just focus on your work and don't think about, oh, how other people are gonna think about my work. Don't think about what's outside. Just think about yourself when you make the work. Beautiful. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, I think Catherine covered it pretty well because doing art is really, it's really lonely, you know, and you can get sucked in you just get stuck in the routine of doing things. So I think you've just got to remember to just like reconnect with people, stay in touch, you know, um, stay inspired, take breaks, you know, um, and stay hungry. Like do things that are a little out of your comfort zone, just not too much, just a little bit. You shouldn't get comfortable because once you do, you just, you, you, you lose that, that edge, that, that drive that you have, I feel. And we've all fallen into it at times, I think. You know, but you always go back to like, no, keep focused on what you want to do. It might take a long time, but I, it might not happen the way you want it to happen either. I think people have this preconceived notion, this romanticized vision of what it's like to be an artist in London. You know, like they've seen the films, Love Actually, and all that stuff. And it, it really isn't like that. But um, yeah, just stay focused and, you know, eye on the prize and you'll be fine. I love that hundred percent. Yeah, like honestly, like nothing goes the way you plan it to, and like life is not linear. So just really great advice from the three of you that really be focused and be people have support system so important. And before we throw um, the questions to the audience, we just share like your Instagram handle where we can find you, upcoming exhibitions, things like that. Yeah, for sure. So I'm on Instagram. Um, I'm part of the internet. Uh, my handle is just my full name, Catherine Ko Chen. And in terms of upcoming stuff, uh, I have a two-person show happening down in Cornwall with North Coast of Scotland over in April. So I will be posting about that. And all of you are very welcome to come. My Instagram is underscore xu dot. Y A N G underscore. So, <laughs> underscore my, my surname, that's my first name, underscore. Yeah, that's the one. And um, um, I got a show in Hong Kong with Mo Gallery coming up. Yeah, really excited about that. And uh, I got a really important, like, really amazing. Um, LGBTQ related public commission coming up. If you follow me, you're going to find out. <laughs> right. Um, my IG handle is Beware the Lunatic. Uh, my Twitter handle is Lunatic Beware. Um, I don't have anything coming up. I'm taking a long holiday. So um, after that, later in the year, I'll probably be up to something. So, yeah. Lovely. And thank you so much for sharing.